Hello, hello, welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon for those it's afternoon. Good night for those it's nine and good good morning for those it's evening uh, for morning because uh, as you know you have audience from all parts in the world. Welcome to the Alago webinars, new trend on organic geochemistry. I am Professor Boniek Guntijo from Federal University of Goiás and General Secretary of Alago. I'm super excited to have you here, excited about amazing talk and conversation we are going to have today about polar compounds. Now, before we begin, I thank all our sponsor and the organized committee for enabling this brilliant event. In addition, I have a special invitation to you to become a LAGO member. More information can be found on the description in this YouTube channel. And, and be, by joining a LAGO, we, uh, you'll be a part of a brilliant, exciting society. And uh, you have a chance to to follow us and be updated about next uh, events. And uh, move back to the topic today. It's very now that most knowledge on organic geochemistry is based on nonpolar compounds, especially to crude oil assessment. And uh, polar compounds can be a uh, new trends on organic geochemistry or be a new water zone that emerges in this field. And I have a, a great pleasure to be here to, uh, with me today, Dr. Ryan Rogers, a renowned researcher uh, in this field. He received a bachelor in chemistry from the University of Florida in 1995 and PhD in analytical chemistry under the direction of Dr. Alan Marshall from Florida State University in 1999, following a postdoctoral appointment in aerosol mass spectrometry at Oak Ridge National Laboratory under the direction of Michael Ramsey. He joined the Ion Cyclotron Resonance Program at National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, now, today now as MEGLAB, as assistant scholar scientist and coaches faculty member of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at FSU. He currently directs environmental, petrochemical, and forensic applications of FTICR mass spectrometry at MEGLAB, and also is director of the Future Refuse Institute and FSU Distinguished University Scholar and Past Associate Editor of Energy and Fuels, an uh, American Chemical Society journal. Dr. Raya, thanks for coming today, and you, your turn. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Boniek. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so what I'm going to uh, talk to you today about um, is uh, polar compounds and petroleum. Uh, we'll we'll start a discussion of petroleum um, uh, to start, uh, and then talk about the contributions of high resolution mass spectrometry to the understanding of petroleum, and then we'll uh, progress from there to uh, asphaltines, uh, and then uh, get into some of the uh, polar chemistries that that I feel are are very uh, interesting for for future research. So I don't do this research alone. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is uh, part of a joint lab, which is the IC2MC lab uh, with Pierre Gusti from Total, uh, Brice Boussieri from uh, University of Po in France, and then Carlos Alfonso from the University of Rouen. Um, are my international colleagues. Um, the work that I'll show you uh, was done both by uh, Sydney Niles and Marta Chacon um, with assistance from Juan Chen and, and Amy McKenna. So uh, first and foremost, um, the facility that I work at is a user facility. Uh, we're an international user facility. Um, so if you uh, have interest in the research or potentially 
uh, using the facility, please uh, feel free to contact me uh, after the talk. So the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory is in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, it's a, a rather large facility. Um, the NMR and ICR uh, wings are down here, just these two small sections of the building. Um, and that's what I'll be uh, discussing today is, is the mass spectrometry component. Um, so when we talk about high resolution mass spectrometry, uh, the first question is, is, why is it useful? Um, and so shown here is the highest magnetic field uh, in the world uh, for this uh, te technique, uh, which is here at the Magnet Lab in one of the buildings I just showed you. Uh, it's a 21 Tesla FTICR. Uh, and what it allows us to do is it allows us to probe um, the molecular composition of very high boiling species. And so none of these species can go through a GC column, especially the polar ones. Um, and they're so complex, you know, it, this is a vacuum uh, residue. Uh, you can see has about 105,000 different individual peaks in it. Um, the complexity is, is really uh, so high that it, it cannot be handled by, by any other form of, of mass spectrometry. Even if you're able to uh, get the species through a GC column, uh, you, the mass spectrometer that uh, would be on the other side of that would be incapable of resolving all these species. And so this is just to give you an idea of how complex they are. Uh, this is a one uh, Dalton segment of the mass spectrum. Uh, and there's 462 peaks uh, in here that are resolved. Uh, and here uh, resolved at 1.1 millidalton, which is about twice the mass of electron. And they're all resolved and identified, or uh, uh, the centroid can be determined at, at very, very high accuracy. Um, and that's even in the case of ultra high complexity. So there's a quadruplet uh, of peaks and the spacing between each one of these peaks is at or less than the mass of electron. And so uh, I, I hope you can see that, you know, this type of performance is, is not attainable by, by any other form of mass spec. And so what this allows us to do is take the mass spectrum um, and then each one of these peaks is measured out to the fifth or sixth decimal place. Uh, this yields a mass accuracy of 50 to 200 part per billion. At this mass accuracy, you can ask a computer uh, what combination of C, H, N, O, S, iron, nickel, vanadium, uh, and other uh, heteratoms adds up to this mass within this error. Uh, and it allows you to get the elemental composition just from accurate mass. And so this is the enabling technology uh, combined with the resolution uh, that makes this technique so useful. So as I said earlier, you have literally tens of thousands of different peaks. So the easiest way to visualize those is to group them by the heteratom content. So in this case, it would be S1. And so all of the species that have a single sulfur are grouped. And then they're plotted um, as a function of double bond equivalent and carbon number. And so this double bond equivalent is given by the relationship of carbon to hydrogen to heteratom content by this formula uh, from McClafferty and Turacek. And so the carbon number goes in here, the hydrogen goes in here, and if you have any nitrogen, and then you simply just calculate the double bond equivalent. It is the number of rings plus double bonds in the molecule. And so you can think of this as a measure of aromaticity. Um, benzene would be four, uh, DBE of four, because it has three double bonds and one ring. So from just measuring the mass, we get the elemental composition. From the elemental composition, you get the number of rings plus double bonds. And then the carbon number is just the carbon number. And so by plotting all of the species in a heteratom class together in this plot, you get an idea of the compositional space uh, that is occupied uh, by this chemistry. Uh, and that's where in, in comparison of these is, is what I'll show later is 
is very informative. So we are talking about polar molecules, especially a little bit later in the talk. Um, and of course, none of this would be possible without uh, John Finn, uh, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for his contributions in the development of electrospray ionization. Um, this truly changed the world um, and was happening right at the end of my uh, graduate uh, career uh, because there was no more polarity or boiling point restrictions in ionization. So you didn't have to volatilize something and then hit it with electrons to, to get an ion. And so this uh, just uh, absolutely com uh, completely changed uh, uh, petroleum mass spectrometry. And so uh, one pioneer being John Fenn on the mass spec side, but another one uh, uh, on the petroleum chemistry side uh, was a gentleman from Chevron uh, named Miatek Bodozinski. Uh, and he, he basically was wanting to find out, you know, what could you do with accurate mass or at the time high resolution mass spectra to understand how the composition of petroleum changes with, with boiling point. And so that work um, was summarized in this book um, by Miatek Bodozinski and Klaus Alpkett. And uh, it really it lays down um, all mostly from uh, field ionization sector mass spectrometry work, um, the relationship between composition and uh, boiling point. And it's affectionately called the Bodozinski continuum. Um, and when we refer to a continuum, uh, that's shown here. And so uh, this is actually how Miatek plotted the data, um, where you have initial boiling point and then all the way down to the end of uh, HVGO, heavy vacuum gas oil. And uh, this data was cur courtesy of Parvis Rahimi uh, on his samples of bitumen. Um, but what captured Bodozinski's uh, curiosity immediately was the fact that from the initial boiling point all the way to the end of HVGO, there were mass spectral signals that were in the same M over Z range. And so what he speculated that, you know, these must be aliphatic and these must be aromatic. That's the only way they could be in the same M over Z range uh, and have such huge changes in boiling point. And so that concept uh, was compared against boiling, known boiling points of N-alkanes, uh, naphtheno uh, compounds, and naphtheno aromatics, and heteratom-containing compounds. And he basically laid out this continuity concept, where if you look in any of the common boiling points used in refineries, the highest carbon number species would be the alkanes, and then as you go from alkanes to naphthenos uh, compounds to naphtheno aromatics to aromatics to heteratom containing compounds, every time you do that, you go down in carbon number. And so that's why in a, in a narrow boiling cut, you can have a wide range of carbon numbers. And so this relationship that every time you add a heteratom, you lose two to three carbons, uh, was something that uh, we could test directly uh, from the high resolution mass spec data. And so we did that. And so here's your boiling point distribution. And here's our carbon number, our DBE versus carbon number images. And this is for the hydrocarbon class. And so for every single boiling cut, of course, you can see in the boiling cuts, it goes up in carbon number as you go up in boiling point. But if we add a heteratom, so if we go from the hydrocarbon class to the S1 class, according to Miatek Bodozinski, every one of these distributions should shift down in carbon number, two to three carbon numbers. And then if we go from the S1 class to the S2 class, adding another heteratom, they should shift again. And so we did this for the polar compounds, we did it for the nonpolar compounds, uh, and the results are summarized in the next two figures. So as we increase the heteratom content, we should see these shift to the left. And so we go from the hydrocarbon class to the S1 class, 
and from the S1 class to the S2 class, every one of these distributions shifted two to three carbon numbers as you added heteratom content. And so, like I said, we also did this for polar compounds uh, going from uh, O1 to O2, from O2 to O3, and also for sulfur containing uh, aromatics as well, uh, had, uh, polar compounds. And we saw the relationship over and over and over again. And so it basically proved to us that that was was correct. And so one of the other things we did was we took um, the all of the species that are identified here and here and here. And if you add them all up, then you should get a continuum. And so when we did that, uh, this is what you get. Uh, we get the continuum. So we have continue, we're continuous in carbon number and we're continuous in aromaticity. So that checks out as well uh, for, for what Mia Tech Bodzinski said. But it had uh, you know, some pretty interesting implications. Because if this, so you have your in alkanes and you have your aromatics uh, along this line, and this defined the maltine continuum. And so if this is the maltine continuum, um, the idea was, at the time was that asphaltines were very high molecular weight species. And so we can test that theory uh, by simply extrapolating this maltine continuum until you get to the accepted H to C ratio of asphaltines, which is 1.1. And so what happens is, is you, you have to extrapolate this to a carbon number that is 70,000 in order to get to an H to C ratio of 1.1. And so clearly this can't be correct. Um, it, it, you cannot extrapolate this continuum and get to asphaltines. And so the idea that asphaltines were very high molecular weight uh, just didn't work. And of course, Miatek Bodzinski knew this uh, and, and his theory was, was that the most aromatic you can be uh, are the bare PAHs. Uh, and so in mass spectrometry world, that's, that's this line here. And so Miatek Bodzinski proposed that acetines basically sit right on top of maltines in carbon number space. They're just more aromatic. Uh, and so acetine space would, would be here. So it's higher aromaticity, it's not higher carbon number. And that's what should account for, for asphaltines. And so as mass spectrometrists, we can test this as well. And so when we compared a crude oil to an asphaltine, uh, you see that all the peaks shift down in mass defect. Uh, and that makes sense because in mass spectrometry, especially of petroleum, the further you are to the right at a nominal mass, the more hydrogen you have because hydrogen has, uh, doesn't weigh exactly one, right? It has a mass defect, defect of uh, 0.078. So every time you add a hydrogen, you're moving to the right. And so asphaltines being shifted down in mass defect made complete sense because they should have less hydrogen and be more aromatic. So the initial results looked great. The problem is, is that when we plotted the result of the asphaltines on top of the maltines, uh, we have a gap. And so this was very troubling to us because everything we had done to up till now proved that petroleum matched Bodzinski's continuum theory, uh, but now we have a gap uh, in composition. And so we had to figure out where this material was. And so at the time, uh, there was a lot of work being done by uh, NMR and other techniques to the ultrasonics uh, to determine the aggregation state of asphaltines. And so what became readily apparent is that mass spectrometers operate at about two or 300 microgram per mil. Uh, and that would be in the nano aggregated uh, arena. So, uh, we're not sensitive enough to to get down to this nanogram per mil. And so what we realized is, is that most of the asphaltine should be aggregated. And if there's any compositional 
uh, preference to this aggregation, then what we see, which would be the monomer, uh, could not represent the whole sample. Uh, and so we did a lot of work uh, to understand this. Uh, and we basically concluded that, you know, these species should be uh, in, in nano aggregates. And that's why we're not seeing them. It's not higher carbon number. Uh, it's higher aromaticity. But we're missing a section because, because of this aggregation. And this was like, I don't know, 10 years ago. So we confirmed that Bodozinski was right. And we proposed a hypothesis for why the mass spec data was not showing a complete continuum. Um, uh, and then there was a huge oil uh, spill in the Gulf of Mexico uh, here in the United States. Uh, and so this research basically ended uh, and we started a 10 year uh, study of the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. But in the later years uh, of the oil spill research, we restarted uh, our work on asphaltines and in our absence, um, there, there's a lot of things that were done uh, that we honestly just didn't agree with. And that was the original yin model, uh, which was proposed 30, 40 years ago, uh, presented a cartoon to describe the three different states of association of the interactions between uh, asphaltine molecules. And it had the aromatic uh, sheets, it had the aliphatic side chains, and it showed how they stacked and how they interacted and how metals uh, uh, were distributed. But it was just a cartoon. Um, it didn't really have any real physical significance or chemical significance on the structure. The problem was, was that was picked up uh, by Oliver Mullins, and it was turned into the Yen Mullins model, um, where he added the new mass spectral data that suggested that asphaltines were not high molecular weight, a thousand to a gigadalton. Um, they were actually low molecular weight molecules that were very aromatic. The problem is, is that he latched on uh, to the Yen structure of asphaltines, uh, which was a single aromatic core with alkyl side chains. Uh, and he basically stated that uh, the number of pH cores in an acyl T molecule is just one. Uh, and he started saying that there's a small mass fraction with, with more than one. Uh, and as, you know, as, as someone who's done a lot of work in the petroleum arena, um, saying that any, any one molecular class uh, dominates uh, a petroleum is 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 kind of a difficult uh, hypothesis to support. So, but it went on uh, to describe uh, a single aromatic core molecule uh, and how it dictated aggregation to a nano aggregate, and then how these nano aggregates assemble into a cluster. Uh, and one important thing to remember is that. Uh, Oliver Mullins is an upstream uh, petroleum scientist. He's not a downstream scientist. And what he was trying to do was to describe asphaltine gradients, uh, which are shown here in a series of oils collected at different depth, uh, in very large reservoirs. And so the modified uh, Yen model, which became the Yen Mullins model, uh, at least in this application, did an acceptable job. And so it was put forth as the model uh, for, for asphaltine structure. The problem is this. So this is the island, a single aromatic core structure uh, supported by the now Yen Mullins model. But there's also a ton of support uh, for a multi-core uh, so more than one aromatic core with small uh, or short alkyl uh, linkages. Um, but mass spectrometry at the time supported the overwhelmingly supported the island. The problem is, is that if you go to a refiner, um, what he'll tell you is, is that if asphaltines were all island, then 
you, you plug a refinery in, in a single day, right? Because all you can do is turn this to Coke, basically. Uh, and asphalt teams are processed in refineries all over the world. And the reason they're processed is because when you thermally decompose them, you get one to five ring aromatics uh, as distillates. If you process nothing but this, you would get Coke uh, and then light gases from the thermal cleavage of the alkane chains. And so at least from a refinery perspective, uh, you know, the engineers knew that, you know, there had to be a substantial fraction of asphaltines in this, with this structural motif. Uh, but for some reason, this, this gained a lot, gained a lot of traction. And so from a mass spec point of view, this is a very easy experiment to do. So if you isolate these molecules in a mass spectrometer and you heat them up with a laser, uh, you cannot crack across this aromatic core. Uh, all you'll do is chop off the alkane chains. And so the aromaticity or the DBE of the molecule won't change, but the carbon number will because you'll be losing carbon number. Conversely, if you isolate an archipelago species, the charge is gonna reside on one of these aromatic cores. So when you cleave it, you'll only see the portion that has the charge on it because a mass spectrometer requires a charge uh, to, de to detect the, the product ion. And so if you lose this, then you'll lose carbon number and aromaticity. And so the easiest way to think about it is, is that if we isolate um, the mass spectral peaks from this section of the compositional image of carbon number and DBE, and we fragment them and they lose only carbon number, so they only move down on the x-axis, they must be island. If they lose carbon number and aromaticity when we fragment them, they must be multi-core or archipelago. And so we do this experiment uh, by basically exciting all of the species that we don't want out of the ICR cell. Uh, and that leaves us with the species that we're going to then fragment. And so this is, you take the mass spectrum of this little isolated segment, this is your starting material, and then you heat it up and you look at all of the, the fragments. So we did this, so you isolate, uh, you know, a single nominal mass or, you know, a nominal mass, or uh, five to 10 uh, Dalton, uh, and you fragment it, and what we saw is that for some samples, we saw just simple dealkylation. So just chopping off these, these side chains. And when we looked at the carbon number versus DBE images, uh, they suggested island type structures. So the green is, is what we started with. Uh, this is two different irradiation periods with the laser. Uh, and you can actually see the dealkylation occurring. So in carbon number, we're just losing carbon number, losing carbon number, and you end up at the same DBE value that you started with. And as you increase the laser power, you just drive it over to the bare PAH uh, to a greater extent. If you look at it another way, um, red are the DBEs that you start with and gray are the ones that you end up with after fragmentation. They're, they're basically the same. And so this would definitely support uh, an island structure. So if you look at it another way, uh, here are the two that we start with and they have a DBE above 20. After you fragment these, 92% of the signal is above 20. And so, these would be island. But then if you go to another sample, uh, asphaltine sample, uh, you isolate the, the species to be fragmented and you fragment them, you only see a tiny bit of dealkylation, but you see a whole distribution of molecules at low M over Z. And these are cleavage of these alkane linkages. And what you're seeing are the small uh, PAHs that are that are formed from that. And so just as with the other one, we can look at this and here you see dealkylation, but you see that most of the signal is below the DBE that you started with. Or as in the red are the DBEs that you start with, 
but gray is what you generate after fragmentation. And so these are losing carbon number and they're losing aromaticity. So they must be archipelagos. Just as in the previous example, almost the same precursors, but now they're archipelago. So when you fragment them, 97% of the relative abundance from the mass spectrometer is below the DBE that you start with. And so these are archipelagos. And so the, the question is, is what's going on here? So for one sample, you can say asphaltines are island. For another sample, you can look at it and say, um, they're almost all archipelago. And so we set out to, to figure this out. And the way we figured it out uh, is, is by doing fractionation uh, of the, the, the asphaltines using silica gel and a series of, of initially six different solvents, but now we use three. And so you immobilize the asphaltines on silica, you soxalate extract them, Acetone is known, uh, we didn't come up with this, it was in the literature, for removing uh, bare and low alkylated PAHs. Uh, heptol or heptane toluene is sort of an in-between solvent. And then here's where you get to the polar molecules. Uh, if you go at it with a, a proton donor or disruptor, pro, uh, hydrogen bond disruptor, uh, then you get the more polar molecules come off in the toluene THF methanol. And so it was very pleasing to us that when we, we did this on lots of different samples, but if, if you look at the mass spectrometry data on the top and the gravimetric data on the bottom, so when we fractionated the whole sample, we got 28% in the acetone, 12% in the heptol, and 37% in the toluene THF. But when you run the mass spectrum, the whole sample looks exactly like the acetone. So even though more than half the sample is over here, uh, for some reason, the acetone uh, resembles the whole sample. And so what we found out is that if you look at the ionization efficiency um, or how efficiently they generate ions uh, in the mass spectral analysis, the reason that the whole sample looks like the acetone is because the acetone fraction ionizes, you know, 12 times and 25 times more efficiently than these fractions. And so this really gave us a clue that, uh, you know, when you analyze these by mass spectrometry, there's selective ionization and you have to be very careful uh, about uh, interpreting the results. So the most surprising thing is, is that when you run the structural analysis of the whole sample, uh, you just see this dealkylation, uh, which would tell you that the whole sample is island. If you look at the acetone fraction, it's island. So, but this ionizes way more efficiently than these others. And so when you go to these, these fractions that you can't even see when you analyze the whole sample, uh, you start to see a transition to archipelago. And then when you go to the largest mass fraction, uh, you see that it's almost all archipelago. So in other words, the reason that you never see the archipelago is because this material in the acetone fraction, which is island, ionizes 25 times more efficiently than this. And so we believe that's why mass spectrometry has always supported uh, an island structural motif even though in this case, more than 50% of the sample is archipelago. And so I mentioned the uh, aggregation issues before. Um, and so we tested this again by simply titrating uh, the whole sample with heptane uh, to get an instability curve. So this is amount participate, precipitated with amount of heptane added. And you can see the stability of the whole sample. But then when you compare it to the acetone, you see that the acetone is very stable. And so it does not aggregate very, very well at all. And then when you compare that against the polar fraction, you see that there's an enormous difference. So at 20 volume percent heptane, 
almost none of the acetone is precipitated. We're at about 80% of the toluene THF is. And so we believe this is why there's such a huge ionization efficiency difference, because this is in the form of monomers. This is in the form of aggregates when you try to run them by mass spectrometry. So we checked this using uh, GPC. Uh, so we're monitoring both uh, sulfur and uh, vanadium. And so this is the whole sample monitoring sulfur in the high molecular weight, medium molecular weight, and low molecular weight regions. And for both vanadium and sulfur, when we monitor this by ICP, when you compare the heptane or the acetone fraction to the toluene THF, you can see that there's a huge difference in their aggregation state. And so uh, we believe that this is the reason uh, mass spectrometry has always supported uh, island. So I'll just throw in, so we, we got involved in that oil spill research that I said, and we, we got into a weird way to prove that archipelagos have to exist. Uh, and it was through photochemistry. And so what we were doing, we were looking at thin films of petroleum and photo irradiating them to mimic what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. But at the time we had this way to fractionate acetines into acetone, which is island dominant and toluene THF, which was archipelago dominant. So we decided to check that with, with photochemistry. And so if you take an island dominant fraction from an asphaltine and you photo irradiate it, this will absorb the light and then it will oxidize on the periphery. Well, that should give you tar because this will remain water insoluble. Uh, and then the oxygen on the periphery will have them stick together and, and you should get tar. And so we did that experiment and lo and behold, we got tar. And so the film disappears, it sinks and it sticks to the stir bar, which is Teflon, uh, and you get sticky tar. The water is clear and you get almost no water soluble species. So island dominant, you shine light on it, the film disappears and you get uh, tar. This is what happens when you, when you photo irradiate an archipelago fraction. So here's your thin film, you irradiate it with sunlight, you cleave these bonds, the molecules oxidize and you get water solubles. And so there's a huge difference in the photochemistry and the photochemistry products prove that archipelagos exist uh, and that they are a dominant fraction in, in asphaltines. Uh, and they're, they're very polar. So, to close the talk, I'll get into some polar molecules. Um, I'm not going to talk about nitrogen and sulfur. Uh, we published for about 15 years on these uh, for sulfides and sulfoxides and thiophenes and pyridinic and perolic nitrogen. Uh, I just wanted to put forth, I think, still an exciting arena for future research uh, is in the oxygen continuum. Um, and I have a paper that I should have published like two years now, and I'm still working on it, but uh, it uh, hopefully I'll give you some idea of, of, of the results that we have. So it all started with Jan Czerneski. Uh, we were looking at interfacial material, things that stabilize emulsions. And so he wanted to know the composition of this. And so what we did is we came up with a wet silica method uh, to isolate interfacial material. If you coat silica, with 23 monolayers of water, um, it's still a free flowing powder. Uh, so you can pack a column, but the water is so thick that the petroleum can't see it. And so this is like a mobilized water. And so you can use it to pull surfactants uh, out of petroleum. So you take the wet silica, you add the diluted crude oil, the surfactants will stick to the water. And then you rinse the non-surfactants off with heptol or heptane toluene. And then you add methanol, which disrupts the hydrogen bonds in the water, and you can retrieve the surfactants. 
And this would be the interfacial material, the, the things that cause an emulsion. And so when we tested this, this is 99 weight percent that came off in heptol that doesn't interact with water. This is one weight percent that does interact with water. And you can clearly see that one causes an emulsion and the other does not. If you run the mass spectrum and analyze the molecules, you can see that the whole oil and the inactive fraction are exactly the same. And all of this interfacial material is all this crazy polar material with sulfur and oxygen, nitrogen and oxygen. They're basically naturally occurring surfactants and their aromaticity is very low. So if you look at the DBE versus carbon number plot, these are mostly aliphatic but they are asphaltines, they, they are not heptane soluble. And so this idea that asphaltine stabilize emulsions is true, but we think that it's a small subfraction of asphaltines that stabilize them and they are these uh, very polar surfactants. So I talked to you about selective ionization. And so if you analyze uh, the interfacial material, uh, we analyzed lots of different interfacial materials and they all look the same. And so we had a, a, an, a hypothesis that selective ionization was limiting what we were seeing in the mass spectrometer. And so we came up with a modified aminopropyl silica fractionation uh, to basically spread this out uh, as a function of carbon number and, and hydrophobicity. And so when we did that, we were amazed at the underlying complexity. So this is what you get if you analyze the whole sample. And these are the fractions that come off uh, the, the MAPS fractionation. And so you can see that what you're seeing is only about one tenth of what's there. And so if we analyze the first two MAP fractions, they do not resemble the, the interfacial material. They're actually clear, but all of these mass spectral peaks uh, account for everything you see if you analyze the whole sample. And so if you continue to go to map fraction three and four, uh, we identified dicarboxylic acids along with the monoprotic acids. And now the complexity is, is, un, is just incredible. And so, Selective ionization can, can really limit what you see. And just as with the uh, whole interfacial material, these are aliphatic and also aromatic now, we can see uh, uh, acids. And these are the singly charged, and then the doubly charged are, of course, higher molecular weight, uh, but they're largely aliphatic. So this is the, the bad part of the story. So these form loose emulsions, uh, and here are your diacids right here. So you start to see tighter emulsions, but the really stable emulsions, the mass, spect the mass spectral signal goes to nothing. Uh, and so it's very troubling because we suspect that as these get larger and larger, they start to self-associate uh, and we just can't see them in the, in the mass spectrometer. Uh, but we can certainly test their interfacial activity and, and, and show that they cause emulsions. So that brings us to the start of this continuum. And so I got into some research uh, early on where we looked at uh, aminopropyl silica isolation of acids. Uh, and then if you treat them with ammonia, uh, you get a precipitant, uh, which is a crystal. Uh, and then when you analyze the crystal, uh, you get iron acids. So tetra, tetraprotic acids. So these are four carboxylic acids in a 1.2 kilodalton molecule uh, that causes major deposit issues, which I'll, I'll get into later. And so the idea of having a tetraprotic acid that was not aromatic and yet still caused major problems in, in upstream uh, and downstream uh, operations was really we figured was the upper bound uh, of oxygen content and polarity. And then we ran into this guy, uh, sodium naphthenates, 
Uh, and when we did the map fractionation, so this is map fraction one, two, three, four, five, and this is the amount recovered. We were able to regenerate the problem with just this first map fraction. And it gives you a loose emulsion, this creamy type uh, emulsion. And it was caused by uh, C30 mono acids. Uh, and then when you compare that to the calcium naphthenate, so this is the tetra acid uh, that causes this nasty deposit, we could reproduce, or we knew that all the tetra acids were right here in the fourth map fraction. And so at the time, we proposed that, you know, the, the oxygen continuum for petroleum should be between map fraction one and four. So you had a C30 mono acid, and then you ended in a C80 or 90 tetra acid. Uh, that spanned what we thought was the, the boundaries of, of these polar uh, acids. And then we started looking at these emulsions. And so we compared the map fraction data that we got here uh, to the sodium and calcium naphthenates. And we were kind of shocked at what we saw. Uh, a tight emulsion went all the way to mat fraction nine. And then I, I showed you that most of the interfacial activity was, was out here. And so the idea is that the, the oxygen chemistry in petroleum is much richer than I think most people realize. And we went on to show that, you know, this mat fractionation um, it, with a simple tight emulsion gives you this wide range of behaviors from loose emulsions to almost no emulsion with very tight emulsions between and they're spread across a wide range of hydrophobicity carbon number and number of and types of oxygen functionalities so we we went on and looked at other field deposits and so this is a sort of a combination. So it's a loose emulsion, but it has solid deposits in it. And you can see all of this crazy oxygen uh, containing organics that we found in it. And we were very, we were very pleased that when we put this on the map, uh, through maps fractionation, we got a bimodal distribution. So it looked like a sodium naphthenate, but it also looked like uh, something that formed deposits or tighter emulsions uh, in solids. And so this was really getting started um, and we were excited about it uh, and applied it to one uh, real world field sample. And so this was just crazy amounts of oxygen. So this is a solid deposit from a production facility. Uh, it has both nitrogen and oxygen containing uh, and sulfur containing oxygen species. And we had to go all the way out to mat fraction 10 um, to, to try to get it off the state, the amino propyl silica. And so with this deposit, now the mat fraction goes off the scale. So we're past mat fraction 10 and about 20% of this material would, wouldn't even come off the stationary phase. And so again, I, I think there's a, a huge opportunity to, to understand the oxygen continuum and how it relates to uh, both water uh, issues as well as uh, uh, fouling. And, you know, I didn't show the mass spectra of these, but uh, they're not aromatic. So they are, they do have aromatic uh, components, but they're largely aliphatic. And so uh, they can have pr pronounced effects uh, in, in, in behavior. So just to summarize, you know, you have tight emulsions that span the entire range of, of map fractions. You have loose emulsions, which are mostly at the beginning. You have this tight emulsion, which is shown here. You have hard uh, scale-like deposits, that, at least when they cure. Uh, that is map fraction four, but ranges from one to six. You have mixed systems, which are part of this and part of that, which have bimodal distributions. Uh, and then you have very, very uh, nasty deposits that are uh, basically off the scale. 
uh, in, in the map fractionation. So understanding this, uh, this aggregation, which causes problems in the mass spec analysis, I, I think is, is a really interesting area for future research. And with that, my time is, is up. So I'll thank you for your attention and uh, thank Total, uh, IC2MC, University of Poe, E2S, and the Gulf of Mexico for, for uh, and NSF in the state of Florida for funding. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for the wonderful and exciting talk and for sharing today your knowledge in the field. And now we'll have a couple of questions here. I will read for you um, the questions. Um, first of all, the first is from Lydia from Federal University of Goiás. And of course, we have another one. It's the same theme. Uh, it's from Rosiana from Federal University of Sergipe, Brazil. Uh, they both ask you about and uh, how to recognize the region in the mass spec should the, to elucidate the archipelago or uh, island uh, egg structure. Uh, it seems like if you isolate and you have uh, isobaric collusion, how do you elucidate this type of egg structures by, based on the mass spec? Uh, through the fractionation. <laughs> So, I mean, the, the fractionation is is critical because, okay. you know, if if you have any little bit of the acetone fraction in your acetine, um, that's all you'll see. Mm -hmm. And it, it's almost all island. And so you have to get that out of the way. Um, and sometimes it's five weight percent. Other times it's. 25 weight percent but if you don't get that material out of the way you'll never see anything that's underneath it um and that that acetone fraction is almost always island dominant and so i i think the the fractionation is key and then what we do is uh in a mass spectral range from like uh, 300 to 1200, uh, we pick four different points uh, to isolate and fragment um, to look at the island to archipelago ratio. Okay. The second question is from Rosana Cardoso. It's actually in here in UFG. It's now what determines the context of island and archipelago structure in Asphalten. And I complement this question because I have another uh, highlight here. It's about uh, if uh, thermal material can uh, uh, have some influence on this type of uh, structure. Yeah, I would love to know the answer to that question. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we don't have the samples um, to do that, but I know Murray Gray, um, is is pulling all of our results and looking at island archipelago ratios mm -hmm. and then he's correlating that to processability mm. so and i think he'll he'll present that at petrophase but i think we're very close um the problem is is that with the cost of oil right now uh no one's funding research so um but i think we're very close in in making that that connection uh, okay. i i cut that section out of my talk <laughs> um, but we have two acetine samples whose mass spectra look identical and if you isolate the same mass regions in each one uh one is 95 percent archipelago and the other one is 95% island. Oh, nice. <laughs> so mass spectrometry alone, you know, you have to have the fragmentation to understand uh, what, what structures you have. Okay. 
uh another That's a great question <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, let me see here uh another question is gutierre salgueiro from federal university of rio de janeiro a uh, great presentation could you talk about the changelings in quantifying the polar compounds using esi uh, high resolution mass spectrometry yeah um it's very difficult um so the selective ionization that occurs um, for acidic species uh, is is just brutal. Um, so it, it's very bad. So you can have in some of the samples I I showed um, the low molecular weight range material was less than five percent. Mm -hmm. um, but if you analyze the sample, that's all you see. So it's kind of like asphaltines. If, if you don't get the acetone fraction out of the way, you're only going to see the low molecular weight acids that don't, don't self-associate. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we're strongly, our results strongly suggest that intermolecular interactions uh, are what drive a lot of problems in in oil production uh and processing um both in asphaltines uh and naphthenates uh certainly in 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 some of the mixed organic scale deposits that we've seen that i can't talk about but uh you know we, we have data on that you know it, these these polyfunctional molecules, they stay soluble in petroleum by aggregating. Um, and they, they can cause big time problems. And the geochemistry of them and their history, I would, God, I would just love to know. Yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome. Okay, yeah, everybody. <laughs> Rosanna is again. Can you explain why do you adopt the term monomeric? It remembers me repetition unit life in polymers. Yeah, I I mean we called it. We used ionization efficiency, mm -hmm. um, and in our first publication, uh, the reviewers just hammered us, uh, and they said we couldn't say ionization efficiency. So they wanted us to use monomer ion yield. So that, that term did not come from us. It, it came from a reviewer that insisted that we use it. <laughs> but we would just say free molecules versus aggregated molecules. <laughs> um, but because of that first publication, it's just sort of always been there for monomer ion yield. I, I agree completely. Uh, okay. Now another question is from Joelma, is from Petrobras, and she said some process as biodegradation, gas injection, CO2, CH4, natural gas can destabilize the fluid into the reservoir and cause of some high molecular weight precipitation. Are there any difference on this process to produce archipelago or island asphaltenic structure? Yeah, I, I would. I would argue that they're not high molecular weight. Um, they may have a high apparent boiling point, but mm -hmm. I, I would not say they're high molecular weight. Um, I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying you can't blanketly say that they're they're high molecular weight. Um, so we have uh, some data that suggests that these polar molecules. So if you look at pressure drop versus solvent drop asphaltines. Mm -hmm. Um, they're completely different. Um, I, I can't really discuss the structural differences because uh, those samples cost a lot of money and <laughs> all, all of that research was done proprietary. Yeah. Okay. So live, live oil samples are very expensive to get. So uh, <laughs> those studies were, yeah, I, I can't talk about them. Okay. Ryan, you have more three questions. I don't know if you have time to answer or you can send you the question. You can oh, answer us. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. 
Uh, the another question is uh, Gabriela Vanini is from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. What are the biggest difficult changes in the analysis using high resolution mass spectrometry in terms of ionization stability and data repeatability? Uh, aggregation. Aggregation. Okay. Yep. I mean, it, it's it's killing everyone. Um, so, you know, all of the dilute and shoot um, analyses for, uh, you know, neutral nitrogen, basic nitrogen, and all, all that's been done. And, and, it, and it's very trivial. Um, when you push to uh, production deposits, uh, refinery deposits, um, unreacted species uh, in hydro treating, uh, what we're finding is, is that they, they all stick to each other. Um, and so they're polar molecules that basically um, hide uh, and remain soluble in petroleum by aggregating. So they, they hide their chemical functionality uh, and they only stick out the, the alkanes or the uh, alkane chains. And so that's how they, you know, they stay soluble. But uh, due to destabilization or, or, or water flooding or all these other things, uh, you can perturb that and then they come out and they can cause big time problems. Yeah. Okay. The next one is from Renzo Silva, Calgary. Are you aware of any geochemical hypothesis on the formation source of the archipelago with structures? Just from Calgary, Renzo. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and like I said, we would love to know that answer, um, but the the sample sets we need uh, are all in oil companies. So, um, you know, I, I think our, our techniques are developed to a point where we could answer that, um, but that is a ton of work um, and we don't have the samples. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I totally agree. I would love to know how not only the ratio, but also the number of islands in an archipelago changes as a function of thermal history, uh, deposition environment, source material, all that stuff. I think that'd be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one is Luis André Mendes from Petrobras, SEMPS. Great presentation, Ryan. What do you think about XRD and mass spectrometry working to get to sea island in archipelago structures and degradation measurement? And what is the lower resolution in order to do this analysis, please? Well, I mean, I think XRD, I think anything that you bring to the table uh, to help the mass spec, um, I mean, that's why uh, we started IC2MC. Um, so, uh, Brees Boussieri is, is an ICP, ICP guy. Uh, Pierre Gusti is a, is a production and refining chemistry person. And Carlos Alfonso is an ion mobility a mass spectrometry person. So, um, I'm in that group because I, I think ICP has a lot to say on where the metals end up and why uh, in these aggregates. Um, but I think XRD is a great idea. I think uh, anything that can give you insight into uh, the aggregate structure uh, or semi-quantitative uh, island versus archipelago or aggregated versus unaggregated is, is uh, invaluable. Um, and, and we're certainly not saying that archipelagos are the only things that aggregate. Uh, of course, that's not true. Um, but the data does strongly suggest that they aggregate much more efficiently than islands. Okay, thank you. The next one is from Professor Alberto from Federal University of Egypt. Thanks, Ryan, for presentation. Did you find any correlation to asphalt tenic structures, island and archipelago with the source rock like kerogen type one or two, or with the organic matter source of the oil? Yeah, um, no, because we don't have those samples. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I, I, I agree with 
with all of the questions uh, on this subject. I think it's a fantastic question and uh, I think it would be fantastic to, to do that research. Okay. And the next one is from Georgiana Feitosa Wenf. Thanks for your great presentation. Calcium naphthenate formation is thought to depend largely to tetraprotic naphthenic acids, iron, in crude oil, whereas sodium naphthenates originate from lower molecular weight monoprotic naphthenic acids. Could you talk about these and explain what is their relationship with the stability of emulsions? So you're exactly right. So um, sodium naphthenates, um, because the they're dominated by mo monoprotic uh, acids, uh, the the binding pocket uh, accepts the calcium, or I'm sorry, the sodium, uh, and then it's basically done. And you have weak interactions uh, that that cause uh, what appears to be a slight precipitation. And it gives you that milky uh, looking uh, loose emulsion. Um, we think that their growth is largely limited because they're monoprotic and because they have relatively low hydrophobicity because they have a short alkane chain. Um, on the other end, you have um, the tetraprotic acid and its, its binding ability to, to grab a, a calcium with, with two carboxylic acids. Um, but it's, it's a unique structure that's, that's linked to archaea bacteria. Um, so it, it was designed to do that because um, it, it's a lipid from uh, archaea bacteria. So I think in between, you have all the thermal degradation products of, of all the other uh, tetraprotic, uh, diprotic, triprotic and we think they largely explain um weak and tight emulsion formation um and <laughs> if if you ever want to do this experiment um you can take a crude oil uh and shine light on it um and you can get some pretty nasty emulsions <laughs> and so you can mimic uh emulsion problems in the field by just decorating petroleum molecules with oxygen and so we think that uh based on source material and thermal history and the amount of degradation that that has gone on uh will largely determine the distribution of those chemistries and uh, emulsion problems mm -hmm. okay the you have um, two more questions and <laughs> the last ones uh, Hosean from Federal University of Tegip, and about quantifying these island archipelago compounds. Did you try to do that? Did we try to what? The quantify island and archipelago compounds. Uh, we're trying now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's <laughs> it's it's very very difficult. Um, uh, but. Like I mentioned, uh, Murray Gray will present, you know, sort of an idea of semi-quantitative island versus archipelago, and then links to processability of, of heavy crudes. Mm -hmm. So uh, other people are, are, are picking it up and, and trying to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And the last question is from Miguel Orea from Venezuela. Uh, UCV Venezuela, can the trapped compound be liberated from asphalt tins by acetone extraction? No, no. So actually what we see um, is the opposite. So you can bleed off um, low, lowly alkylated aromatics uh, in acetone and even heptane. Um, they'll come off. If you extract for days with acetone or heptane, you can liberate some of the trap molecules. But when we drop the, the most polar fraction, the toluene THF methanol, 
um, it it contains the most trapped material. And how you get it out, uh, we're getting ready to publish a couple of ideas on how to get it out, but uh, uh, it's stuck in there pretty pretty well. Okay, Ryan, thank you for your time here. Thank you for your great talk and for share with us all your knowledge in this field. In name yeah. of Alago, you appreciate it so much. And we welcome you to another uh, or upcoming event. It's a topic of a very uh, attraction in the field. And of course, we will have the future opportunities on that. Thank you. And, no. and thank you guys for staying here with us today. And uh, the next Thursday, you have another Alago webinar. Any, any hope you attend uh, as today? See you, all, see you on Thursday.